Leia here from LeiaFirstSide.com and in this video we'll continue the E1 reaction discussion by analyzing how Zaitsev's rule plays a part in choosing the correct products. If you missed the E1 part 1 video, click here for a brief review of the E1 reaction rate and mechanism. You can also find it on my website LeiaFirstSide.com slash substitution dash elimination. We'll use 1-bromo-1,2-dimethylcyclohexane reacting in methanol and heat as our Zaitsev rule example. We'll analyze this reaction using my four-part checklist to determine that an E1 reaction can take place. You can find detailed videos explaining what to look for for each of these concepts on my website, layerforsci.com slash substitution dash elimination. We'll start with the alkyl chain and first identify the alpha carbon holding the leaving group. Since the alpha carbon is a tertiary carbon, this tells me that we can form a stable carbocation and therefore a one type, meaning SO1 or E1 reaction, can take place. An SN2 reaction cannot take place on a tertiary carbon, but we can also have the E2, so we'll write 1 for the one type plus E2. For elimination reactions, you also want to analyze the beta carbons to ensure that you have beta hydrogens to eliminate. On this molecule, we have three beta carbons, each of which have beta hydrogens, meaning elimination can take place. Next, we look at the leaving group, which is bromine. Since it forms a stable bromide in solution, this is considered a good leaving group, but it doesn't tell me which type of reaction can take place. Next, we'll look at the attacking nucleophile or base. Since we're looking at elimination, we're looking for base rather than nucleophile, but we don't appear to have any. Instead, all we have is methanol as a solvent, meaning we have a solvolysis reaction where the solvent can also act as the attacking molecule. Methanol has lone electrons on the oxygen, making it basic, but because it's neutral, it's a weak base and therefore cannot kick out a leaving group or participate in a two-type reaction. Instead, it has to wait for the leaving group to leave by itself, forming a carbocation, and then it can swoop in and attack. Since methanol is not strong enough to attack directly, we can only have a one-type reaction, and this rules out E2. Remember that when you have a one-type reaction, you'll typically have competition between SO1 or E1. In this case, we'll only look at the E1 reaction. And last, we have the solvent, once again methanol, which is polar protic, and that means it can stabilize any charges that form in solution, once again allowing that E1 reaction to take place. The addition of heat for a one-type reaction helps favor elimination over substitution. So even though we're going to have both SN1 and E1 take place, we'll say that E1 will be favored over SN1. We've determined that an E1 reaction can take place, so let's try to predict the product and then work through the mechanism. Let's ignore stereochemistry for a moment and analyze what we have here. The elimination product is going to form a pi bond between the alpha carbon, which has the leaving group, and the beta carbon from which we pull a hydrogen. On this molecule, we have three different types of beta carbons, which means we can potentially have three different products. We'll show them in different colors so we can analyze what happens. We have a beta carbon on top that has two hydrogens, and we'll mark these in blue. We have a beta carbon as a methyl group, which has three hydrogen atoms. We'll show this in black. And finally, we have a beta carbon below the alpha carbon, which has just one hydrogen, and we'll show this in green. I showed all the beta hydrogens in different colors because now we can analyze what the product would look like when we pull each hydrogen in turn. The first product is when we eliminate towards the blue beta hydrogen. We get a second product when eliminating towards a black beta hydrogen. And finally, we get the third product when eliminating towards the green beta hydrogen. If you can potentially have three different products, how do you determine which one is going to be the correct product? And if you can have more than one product, which is going to be the major and which is going to be the minor? To answer this question, we have to refer to Zaitsev's rule, which tells us that we're going to form the more substituted alkene as the major product. And since alkene substitution is directly related to alkene stability, what Zaitsev's rule is really telling you is that you have to form the most stable alkene. The reason I point this out is that many students memorize the rule without understanding why it happens and then easily get mixed up. 
But if you understand that the reason for this rule is that we're looking for something stable, you can simply analyze your products, determine what is most stable, and that will help you come up with the correct result every time. But in order to do that, we have to understand the trend for alkene substitution and therefore alkene stability. With alkene substitution, any carbon that is directly attached to the sp2 carbon, meaning the carbon that holds the double bond, that is considered a substituent. The more substituted your alkene, meaning the more carbons you have directly attached to your pi bond, the more stable that alkene is going to be. So we'll start with our least substituted alkene, which is simply a carbon double bound to another carbon with no additional carbons attached to that sp2 carbon or pi bond. This is considered an unsubstituted alkene and is going to be the least stable of all your alkenes. Next we have a monosubstituted alkene where you have just one carbon coming off of that pi bond. Next we have a disubstituted alkene and this can show up in three different forms. You can have a cis alkene which has two R groups on either side of the pi bond but they're facing the same direction. You can have a trans alkene where the two R groups are facing opposite directions, and then you can have a pi bond that has both substituents on the same sp2 carbon. All three of these are considered disubstituted alkenes, and their stability is relatively close, so we'll group them together. Next we have the trisubstituted alkene, which has three substituents coming off of the pi bond. And finally we have a tetrasubstituted alkene, which has the maximum number of carbons coming off of the sp2 or pi bound carbons. These are simplifications of molecules. So how do you check on a larger molecule to see how many substituents you have? We'll use the highlighter trick. For the highlighter trick, simply highlight the pi bond on your molecule and then circle any carbons or any groups that directly come off of that pi bond. On this molecule, we have this group here, another top left, and another bottom. This means I have a trisubstituted molecule. Now let's look at something a little more complex. Here we have a slightly more exciting molecule, but we can still use the highlighter trick. We'll start with the pi bond in the ring. After we highlight the pi bond, notice that we have the carbon group on the bottom left, we have a carbon group top left, and a carbon group top right. Because the molecule is so big, I didn't want to circle because it'll get messy, but I still marked everything. Once again, that's tri-substituted. Now let's look at the pi bond on the right. I have no carbons attached on the right side, but I do have a carbon chain going down on the left, another carbon chain going up on the left, giving me a disubstituted double bond. Now let's see how this applies to our previous example. For our first product, we have one, two, and three carbon groups coming off of the pi bond, giving me a tri-substituted alkene. For the second product, we have one, two carbon chains coming off of that pi bond, giving me a disubstituted product. And finally, our third product has one, two, three, four carbon chains coming directly off that pi bond, giving me a tetra-substituted product. Following Zaitsev's rule, we know that the tetra-substituted is going to be the most stable, and that's going to be my major product. The tri-substituted is the second most stable, so we'll call it the middle. And the di substituted is the least stable, so we can call that our minor products. If your professor simply asks for one answer, give the major product. If your professor asks you to draw all products, draw all three and then label them major, middle, and minor to show that you understand that even though all three form, there's still going to be a difference based on stability and based on following Zaitsev's rule. Now let's look at the mechanism just for the major product to make sure you understand what's going on. The reaction begins when bromine grabs the bonding electrons and breaks away from the carbon chain, dissolving in solution and leaving me with a carbon that is now deficient in bonds and therefore has a positive charge. Hydrogens are invisible on skeletal structures, but I'll make the more stable beta hydrogen visible for the sake of this mechanism. And let's not forget, bromine is off somewhere in solution with a negative charge. Notice what happened when the bromine left. What started out as a chiral carbon that had a methyl group facing forward and a bromine facing back no longer has chirality. 
And that's because the starting molecule is sp3 hybridized and that allows it to be chiral. But the carbocation intermediate is sp2 hybridized. That means it's trigonal planar or flat. Trigonal planar atoms do not have chirality. And that's how we lost chirality at the carbocation. Our base for this reaction is the solvent molecule CH3OH and it will reach out with one of its highly electronegative lone pairs of electrons to grab that hydrogen atom. Before we show what happens next, I want you to understand why the next step happens the way it does. Even before the methanol grabs the hydrogen, the electrons from hydrogen are already being pulled slightly towards the carbocation and that's because the positive carbon is trying to surround itself with as much negativity as possible and is slightly pulling on the bond between hydrogen and carbon. So when the methanol reaches over and grabs the hydrogen but leaves the electrons behind, they're more than happy to move in the direction that they've already been trying to move to. And this will cause the bonding electrons to collapse in the direction of the positive charge in order to form a pi bond. The final product has a pi bond between the alpha carbon which had the carbocation and the beta carbon from which we pulled the hydrogen. Notice that once again this step resulted in the loss of chirality. At the intermediate step, the first carbon, meaning the carbocation, changed its hybridization from sp3 to sp2. But when methanol reached out and grabbed the hydrogen, it left carbon with only three sigma bonds and one pi bond and once again we resulted in having an sp2 hybridization or a trigonal planar flat molecule. So while our starting molecule had two chiral carbons, our ending product has no chirality and no stereochemistry given that we have two sp2 carbons where the pi bond is attached as well as a plane of symmetry going through the center of the molecule. Be sure to join me in the next video where I take you through an interesting E1 mechanism that involves a carbocation rearrangement to form a stable product. Are you struggling with organic chemistry? Are you looking for information to guide you through the course and help you succeed? If so, download my ebook, 10 Secrets to Acing Organic Chemistry, using the link below, or visit layofersci.com slash orgo secrets. That's O-R-G-O secrets. For information regarding online tutoring, visit layofersci.com slash orgotutor. That's O-R-G-O tutor. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and even share it with a friend or two. If you have any questions regarding this video, leave a comment below or contact me through my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash layofersci. There will be many related videos posted over the course of the semester. So go ahead and click the subscribe button to ensure that you don't miss out.